Vacuums are supposed to be empty. But to everyone's great confusion, it turns out they're actually full of energy. Space itself might contain a higher density of energy than the nucleus of the atom. This is the prediction of quantum field theory, that there exists an energy of the vacuum resulting from the non-zero zero-point energies of the quantum fields that fill our universe. For the electromagnetic field alone, this energy density has been estimated to be up to a crazily high 10 to the power of 112 ergs per centimeter cubed. Most presentations don't qualitatively define energy, but at the material world, we treat energy as synonymous with material in motion. And so, if the void has energy, what's all the material that's doing the moving and shaking? Disclaimer. The following presentation is not submitted as true per se. That is, we recognize that there's no end-all be-all theory of nature that's possible. Understanding everything with absolute certainty is unimaginable. And so, at the material world, what we explore is what's possible. This is part three of the Material World intro series, where we explain the foundations of a material perspective on quantum mechanics. In part one, linked here, we made the case that fundamental physics is in dire need of a mediator to explain basic phenomena, including fields, which are essentially regions of unknown activity. In part two, also linked up here, we made the case that the mathematics of general relativity, the most experimentally precise description of gravity that we have, are entirely consistent with viewing space-time as an elastic medium. At the end of part two, we introduced the radioelastic model, which proposes that there is an interatomic medium, and it's comprised of stiff elastic filaments that radially extend from the electron shell of each atom. These interconnections allow us to explain not only gravity, as you can see in this video, but also light and electromagnetism. So if you haven't seen parts one and two, please go back and watch those right now. Today, for part three, we're going to use the radioelastic model of the atom to explain vacuum energy. But to get there, we first have to explain elasticity and how we know that the atom and its interconnections are fundamentally elastic. The atom must be an elastic structure because it resonates. Elasticity is the reversible deformation of a composite body. Take an elastic object and deform it at just the right intensity, and suddenly you've got vibration the periodic motion of a composite body. For instance, here's a guitar string. Because the string is composed of atoms, it has the ability to flex. When deformed from its equilibrium position and then released, the string is pulled immediately back to its set point, where the tension between subunit atoms is minimized. Once it reaches that point, however, the momentum of the string pulls it past the equilibrium position in the opposite direction. Again, far from minimal tension, the string rebounds yet again with some losses to friction, and then again, and again, and again, and again, until finally the string is at rest. The rate at which the string vibrates is its fundamental frequency, and it depends on the material properties of the string, including its dimensions. If instead of letting the string's vibration decay, we push it back out of equilibrium every time it wants to restore, we can maximize the vibration into resonance. When we pull a bow across the same guitar string, the string exhibits a slipstick behavior where the string is pulled with the bow and it detaches at exactly the same rate as the string's natural frequency. The result is a sustained vibration of the string. Most objects have more than one resonant frequency, often occurring as multiples of the fundamental. The series of resonant frequencies is called harmonics. Resonance is not unique to guitar strings. All big objects are at least a little elastic, and if driven at the appropriate frequency, vibrate resonantly. Skyscrapers and bridges make great resonators, although maximum vibration is obviously undesirable in these structures. So much so that architects designing these structures have to take their project's natural frequency into account and adjust their dimensions to avoid their work being shaken apart by winds or seismic activity. But what about really small things, like atoms? Do they also vibrate in a sustained, resonant fashion? Absolutely. We've known that atoms vibrate since the molecular theory of heat illuminated that heat is not a flowing liquid of thermal particles, as was formerly understood, but it's best described as the vibration of atoms and their composite molecules, oscillating in location with respect to one another. Today, 
Interatomic vibration is most easily probed using thermal techniques like infrared or Raman spectroscopy, where changes in vibration are directly proportional to stepwise transitions in electromagnetic emissions. Thermal techniques, like Raman spectroscopy, also tell us that it isn't just interatomic collisions that cause resonant vibrations. Light does too. In fact, impinging electromagnetic radiation has the potential to rearrange the shape of the atom's electron shell itself during what's called a quantum jump. This is the principle behind atomic clocks, where one second is the amount of time it takes for a cesium atom to resonate 9 billion times in response to a commensurate pulse of microwave radiation. Atoms as resonant objects is well established. Their shapes have been defined by spherical harmonics as a natural consequence of Laplace's equation, which precisely models basic atomic phenomena from electromagnetism to gravitation. Later, the spherical harmonic shapes appeared as exact solutions to the Schrodinger equation for one electron and a nucleus, essentially the simplest atom, the hydrogen. The recognition of the atom as a fundamentally elastic structure was not uncommon among forgotten pre-quantum thinkers. James McCullough, Thomas Young, and other mechanical physicists were keen on the necessity of this type of practicable interpretation. From their experimentation with light and heat, these bosses surely recognized that the atom is resonant and that resonant vibration can only be defined by periodic deformation of a composite elastic structure. Given this, we can now return to the apparent void between atomic shells. You know, the void that isn't really empty. Our main clue as to what fills these empty spaces between atoms comes from the Schrodinger equation, which models the shape of the electron shells. The hydrogen atom's equation yields solutions that are products of spherical harmonic and radial functions, shown here, where n, l, and m sub l are the quantum numbers associated with the electron shell being examined. If we integrate the absolute square of the wave or radial function centered on position r, theta, and phi, we get the radial probability density for the electron within this given volume. Multiplying that function by the equation for a spherical surface gives us the probability of finding the electron at a given radius from the nucleus. We call this new function the radial distribution function. For a simple 1s electron shell, like hydrogen, it looks like this. Now what's fascinating about both the probability density function and the radial distribution function is that they reveal how one can expect a tiny chance of finding an atom's electron at any distance from the nucleus, as the upper limit of the distribution extends to infinity. The physical implications of this fact is that atomic shells can stretch indefinitely. They could even be physically tethered to one another, and motion among these tethers could be the source of that mysterious vacuum energy. This amounts to a material interpretation of the Schrodinger equation and can help us understand the structure of the medium that's producing the vacuum energy. But most importantly, the filamentary interpretation of the radial distribution function gives us a material that is the source of light and gravity. Light can be modeled as the deformation of filaments between atoms, and gravity can be seen as the aggregate tension between physically connected composite bodies. Again, See our video on gravity, linked in the upper right hand corner for more details, and look out for our upcoming video on light. These electron filaments give a mechanical solution to many, many open questions in fundamental physics, which we're going to soon explore in extreme detail on this channel, including entanglement, the double slit experiment, and so much more. But for now, if the atom is forged from elastic material, as it indeed appears to be, and the electron shell has a filamentary structure, as we posit, and those filaments are responsible for the vacuum energy, what can be definitively said about the atomic material's substructure? There's only one thing that is certain about elastic materials. Reversible deformation requires subunits. While we cannot at this time say for certain what specific structures these atomic subunits should be expected to take, we can make some assumptions. First, it is unlikely that the subunits would be considered particles in the traditional sense, since particles don't easily lend themselves to the tension that's required, either for maintaining the surface tension of the atomic shell, or for being able to do something like affect gravitational pull. Instead, we expect that the subunits are more analogous to the fiber of some kind, which can both interlock and provide for flexion. 
Second, we should expect that the atomic fiber can not only interlock to load tension, but also easily uncouple in order for filaments to meld with one another during translational motion. Finally, we recognize that nature is messy. When looking out at the night sky, we don't find just one type of star. When looking into the soil under a microscope, we don't just find one kind of life form. Therefore, it might be a little bit silly to expect to discover that atomic fiber is perfectly homogenous. It's much more likely that it's diverse in structure and maybe even in mechanical function. The bottom line is that we don't yet know the structure of atomic fiber. Instruments made of atoms will be of no use in detecting such tiny structures directly. So any insight that we have must be gleaned deductively from indirect experiments, many of which are already summarized by the equations of quantum mechanics. What we need now is to consider what structures could satisfy the above requirements, and you can help us. After finishing radial elastic model animations of light and general electromagnetism, we will, with your help, begin to explore potential structures for the atomic fiber. If you want to help us with this, come to our Discord server, link below. Again, thanks for coming by the material world, and if you'd like a short recap of the radial elastic model for the atom, please check out this short two minute video outlining its salient features. We hope you've enjoyed this short three part introductory series to the channel. Share it with people who you think might benefit from it, and stay tuned for more material explanations of nature, right here on Material World.